so Andrew, I wanted to now move on to talking about financial arrangements and settlements when you've got a child with special needs, because it's very different, isn't it, from perhaps what we would say the bog standard case would be. Indeed, it is, Rita. And as we know, this the, the court assesses any application under the Matrimonial Causes Act, Section 25, which is a discretionary-based approach. And in these sorts of cases, you really have to be very creative in thinking outside of the box of the supports and the costs of that and the impact that separation has, particularly where you have a child with special educational needs. So if we take sort of the three main areas, which I'd probably talk about, the house, the resident parent working, which is often, as you know, something that's challenged, and then maintenance, financial support on a long-standing basis. That would probably be a really good way to explore the issues with this. So first of all, the matrimonial home. As we know, courts are generally adopting a process whereby if they can house both parties, they will. We know with the popularity of right move, it's very easy to check how what the level of somebody's housing needs are. But that bog standard approach of perhaps, you know, selling up and dividing the equity, it's not always the right thing and actually generally isn't the right thing when you have a child with special needs, is it? No, you're absolutely right, Rita. And, and also in these circumstances, the first consideration has to be the welfare of any minor, so any child under the age of 18. And looking at, for example, the family home, the first question is obviously the importance of the family home to the child's physical, emotional and educational welfare. So what would the impact of that change to that family home be on the child? Because when you're dealing with these sorts of cases, the the family home is more than a house. Quite often it may have been adapted, particularly, for example, if you have children with ADHD and those children with diagnoses on the autistic spectrum condition, it's their safe place. It helps them relax. It helps them cope with the world around them which to them can be very confusing, very stressful, and can cause real anxiety. And these are very, you tend not to be relevant in the more traditional approach where you don't have a child with special educational needs, but are highly relevant in these complex cases. And that transitioning, you know, not only transitioning to living with the other parent or spending time with the other parent, but the, you know, going through the upheaval of a move when their family unit has broken down, that just could be catastrophic, couldn't it? Exactly. And that's why I say it's the whole process of separation. The child is having to deal with a huge change in its home environment in any event by by means of the separation of their parents and the, you know, the, the changes to the roles, which, which in these sorts of cases is a huge change to a routine. And, but also for children with special education needs, a very minor change to routine can have a huge impact. And that's where courts have to be very careful and do a very detailed and thorough assessment of all the individual needs which children have when they, as I say, in these complex cases involving special educational needs. And in your experience, do you think the courts are factoring in this consideration when particularly they're looking at the family home or that is there still this push towards, well, sale, a division, and let's try and house both parties? Courts are directed to try and achieve what we call a clean break, if at all possible, and to try and house both parties, if at all possible. But that's why I think it's really important that you have specialist lawyers on board from the very beginning to highlight these issues but also to make sure that the evidence is there to support these issues. And I think if the evidence is in front of the judge, um, they are open. uh, Because as I say, you know, the, the statute provides that the first consideration has to be the welfare of any minor, and judges are receptive to these submissions. But as I say, it's important that they're set out clearly at the very beginning of proceedings from the first directions appointment and that you ensure that all the necessary evidence is gathered to support the case. Because nobody's going to necessarily, you know, believe or they may lead to the arguments that 
one parent's exaggerating the needs if there's no independent evidence. So it's something I usually include just at for me stage in quite a lot of detail, you know, particularly if the child has specific diet, you know, a diagnosis, it needs to be there right from the outset, in my view. Indeed, it does. That may be a psychological diagnosis, or as I say, if there is an educational health and care plan for this child, because yeah. that can also be a worry if a house is going to be sold. What's the impact of a change of location or a change of area going Absolutely. to be for a Absolutely. parent where you have a child who's in receipt of an EHCP provision or, for example, a special specialist educational setting? You know, is the sale of the family home desirable because of its proximity to those supports? Or again, is a deferred sale more appropriate? And if so, in these sorts of cases, you've got to really think about bespoke triggers for any future sale. So for example, it could be dependent upon when it's anticipated the child or, or the young person will enter a residential school or yes. achieve independence or indeed transition through to adult services or enter support living provision. But yes. these are all the things that you've got to have in your mind when you're dealing with these cases, dealing with that issue is, you know, is this a case where it's appropriate for the family home to be sold? No, absolutely. And there is this wide judicial discretion as well, which means that they can apply the Section 25 criteria, but the evidence has to be before the court. I think it's a, it's hard to expect judges to make these decisions if there's a dispute between the parties as to the extent of a child's needs. Indeed. Also, moving on from whether or not there's a sale or not, if a judge is, say, looking at, at a sale, well, then the next question is, well, what are the housing need and adaptations of new properties? How can you ensure that that transition works yeah. in the best interests of the child, lower the levels of stress for the child so that the anxiety and confusion and day-to-day -day difficulties they have in understanding the world around them can be mitigated as much as possible? And also, from our perspective as a lawyer, it's, it's supporting their primary carer through that as well, or as if we're helping the non-resident parent appreciate these individual difficulties with these sorts of cases. Do you think there's a stronger argument, therefore, for the departure from equality in favour of the resident parent? In these sorts of cases, in my experience, it's far more common. And, for example, in a lot of cases that I become involved in, you are looking at deferred sales rather than immediate sales because it's ensuring that that first consideration is the welfare of the child. But that has to be based on proper evidence. You know, there can be cases where if you're acting for the non-resident parent who is keen for there to be a sale, well, is it absolutely impossible or is it something which can be transitioned to? And again, this is where expert reports can be very useful by means of occupational therapists or indeed psychologists. And because it can be very difficult, again, for the non-resident parent who's taking the view, well, you know, I'd like a home. I'd like to have a safe space that they can come to. And to be locked out of any equity or being able to rehouse themselves for sometimes years, you know, extending to 10 years or beyond, it's very difficult, isn't it, for them? It, it's hugely difficult. And also at a very difficult, stressful and anxious time for them as well, because they have to look at, well, how can I carve out a future for myself? But also, I often find that they want to support the family as well and they want to support their children, but they want to share in that as much as possible. And in some cases, it may be possible with the right support and with a clear transition but sadly, in other cases, it's just not possible. I mean, often sometimes there's grants that the parties have obtained for adaptations and there's time limits on those that they need to maybe wait out. So there's lots of considerations in respect of that. And as you said, transitioning, if there has been changes to the property, that would have to be done to an property also. And that would also have to be a capital cost that would have to be considered. You know. it, absolutely. As we touched on before, if you're looking at housing needs and adaptations, you've got to think about physical access. Is it suited to the needs of the child? Is in-home care required? Do you need a slightly larger property in order to facilitate that in-home care? Is there a need for respite? These are all the sorts of additional costs that you have to have a look at. And also grants. Uh, grants are important because it's not something that we see in, as it were, a traditional case. 
And again, it highlights the importance of having lawyers who are aware of the individual characteristics of these sorts of cases, because, for example, disability facilities grants or other financial supports, you've got to be careful. And um, can they be ascertained if there are any, what is the payback provision that may have to be included and considered as part of any financial settlement? And these are becoming more and more common due to limited budgets for such provision. So, you know, you're seeing more often clawback provisions, which need to be taken into account when considering the optimum time for the sale of a family home, if the parties are already in receipt of a grant and works have been undertaken to the property. Absolutely. So there's lots to discuss there and lots to consider. I think many of my clients have said that the amount of time and effort that they spend in sort of getting support, special educational needs support, or they have doctors or other experts to move location is complicated, isn't it? It's not as easy. And I think that is a real consideration for many of, of our clients. So I now wanted to move on to, before we discuss maintenance, which is probably the biggest area of concern, I would say, in addition to the house, is the resident parent's ability to work. Now, from my perspective, many of my clients will say, well, it's just not possible for me to work or I have to work on the very lower end of part-time. How do you think the courts deal with that? Again, it's all dependent upon ensuring that they have the information in front of them. Because the difficulty with these sorts of cases, it's making sure that the judge has got the evidence and the knowledge of the individual needs of this child. Because, Rita, as you quite rightly point out, if one has a child who has a diagnosis of autism, they may not be able to be placed into a normal school environment. You may be looking at homeschooling and the huge impact that that will have upon a carer's ability to exercise an earning capacity, not just in the short term, but the medium term as yeah. well. And those are real things that have got to be factored. Or even if you have a child who is within an educational setting, they may not be able to cope with, for example, after school clubs or breakfast clubs, which will also have a significant impact upon a primary carer's ability to exercise their earning capacity. Um, Again, it massively restricts the hours, doesn't it? Because one of the issues, for example, with autism is the noise and activity around. So to go into a very boisterous after school club just isn't simply an option, is it? No. Or to be able to do that without the support of, of their primary carer. Absolutely. And then the difficulty with that is that obviously that carer has to be invested in that to support the child, which has a detrimental impact upon their earning capacity. And then another thing that a lot of my clients say that just actually the management of the experts report, the appointments is almost a full-time job. I had a client who told me that they actually had to have a salary reduction because they took so much time off to attend appointments over a particular month for their child who had special needs. I mean, you have to have quite a flexible working environment to be able to attend those experts meetings, don't you? They have to be hugely flexible. And also the difficulty is that these parents, quite rightly, the primary carers are so heavily invested yeah. in their child's needs and their support. And you, you are juggling, you know, irrespective of the fact that they're dealing with a separation and breakdown in their relationship, what's going to happen as a result of that separation, they're still having to manage. It may be that you've got occupational therapy reports, speech appointments, speech and language appointments. Uh, you've got sensory appointments for the child. They may be having special educational input as well, which the parent is part of. And that has to be managed on a day-to-day -day basis. And the difficulty is that these children need bespoke support. And that's what's vital to their welfare. But unfortunately, that does have um, a very significant impact, as I say, upon their ability to exercise an earning capacity because of that additional time they have to spend caring for or home educating their child. It's very difficult, for, again, for the non-resident parent, isn't it? I mean, they may say, well, my job doesn't give me that flexibility. I have to work in quite a high-pressure environment. I can't take all this time off. So sometimes it's perhaps an unfair criticism to say they're not engaged. But those meetings can be onerous, and they're in the middle of a working day, aren't they? 
They are. And it's trying to strike that balance of having some flexibility, because obviously for them, it's important that they maintain their employment in order to maintain the financial welfare of the family as a unit. And that's why, as I say, there has to be an appreciation on both sides of the difficulties which both parents will face during separation. So for the non-resident parent, they may see this well. The family home won't be sold for many years. The earning capacity and mortgage borrowing capacity, which obviously is another consideration, is not there. They may feel as though they've got a bit of a tough deal here. Well, they may, but as I say, I think it's important that they feel invested in the process. And that's where I think it's important that if you need an expert looking at these issues, that you get that expert advice. Because I often find it's when parents acquire the knowledge that can then lead to an acceptance. And whilst you may be looking at bespoke triggers for the sale of a home at a later date, one could in those circumstances look at an adjustment of capital because of that additional delay. But these are all the sorts of things that need to be thought of as part and parcel. So whilst it may restrict the non-resident parent's ability to rehouse in the short to medium term, they may get a slightly better, as it were, financial settlement in the longer term, whilst also accepting the need of the specific and individual supports that their child needs during their minority. And, and needs evolve, don't they? We don't always have to that they're going to evolve for the worst. It may be that with early provision and early support that the child could be more settled in a few years' time. So it doesn't have to be that it's after 18, for example. Well, precisely. It may be that by investing in the support and having a more measured transition plan, that in the medium to long term, that that lessens because, in fact, it is supporting the child in being able to manage their feelings, managing their emotions and managing their anxiety. And at the end of the day, that's one of the key things that one needs in these sorts of cases. It's helping the child being able to process and to to live within the world that they find so confusing without support and without transitions. We'll be back in a moment. 